Hello, this is Anthony Parent of Parent Parent in Win LLP, the IRS medic. And join me today on this episode where we'll be discussing the IRS Streamlined Offshore Voluntary Disclosure Program updates. So, a little background into this IRS Offshore Voluntary Disclosure Program updates. Uh, we're going to get some short background into the OVDP. And then we're going to talk about the OVDP streamlined rules that were announced June 2014. We're going to talk about how those have been implemented, the domestic versus foreign programs. And then we're going to talk about the streamlined OVDP process. Also going to talk about willfulness, right? We can't go anywhere if we're not going to talk about willfulness. And then what to do if you do not qualify for the streamlined program. Then we're going to talk about who can file. Um, that Did you know that individuals can file? About trusts? Corporations? Can they? How about estates? How about people who made a soft disclosure? Well, we'll answer those questions. And then finally, we're going to conclude with some of the geographic and national trends that we have been seeing since the Streamline program has been updated and liberalized in June of 2014. Now, as promised, I'll give you that short background into OVDP. I do have an OVDP webinar that goes a little bit more detail in the history of taxation. Um, and you can find that in, on our website at irsmedic.com slash voluntary hyphen disclosure. It's probably just easier to go to the website and click around and type that down, right? So, anyway, in 2009, uh, there was a, the original OVDI, they called it, uh, Offshore Voluntary Disclosure Initiative. And that was essentially a one-size-fits-all. But most people didn't realize it applied to everybody with an offshore account. They thought it was just for UBS. And uh, 2011, the IRS changes it to say, hey, everybody, uh, everybody who has a problem can, uh, can come clean. And then they also decided to have a low, lower penalty structure for others. But that getting that lower penalty was kind of rough. Now, in 2012, they increased a slightly harsher penalty for those who were intentionally not reporting. But they were finding that they were getting more and more innocent people. Where were these big, big fish they were looking for that were intentionally evading taxes? They really weren't coming, they really weren't coming clean. So in 2013, the IRS is getting flooded with all these non-willful disclosures. And there's there's a small little streamline thing in there where a 5% penalty would, would apply. But the limitations were so severe, there really were no takers on it. So in 2014, the IRS comes up with a bunch of new rules so that they can clear the backlog of these cases. That they really ended, wound up finding a lot more people who were non-willful, who didn't know they needed to report their worldwide income. So they changed the rules. Of course, the press release was that it was the IRS was being so much kinder and gentler. I happen to think that uh, they couldn't move. Uh, they were paralyzed with the backlog. So this is a way that got them to move cases through. So in 2015, we know that FACA, the Foreign Account uh, Tax Compliance Act is driving everyone crazy. And so some people are thinking about getting into the OVDP, but not sure if they qualify. And in 2016, we know what will be happening as these OVDPs start drying up. The IRS has all these auditors, and we're going to talk about what we think they're going to do. So now let's talk about the streamlined rules and just some general, general outline of it. If you are domestic, that is, you live in the United States, uh, then what you have to do is amend your last three years of return, and you will be penalized on 5% of the highest year-end balance. Now, one important thing to realize, unlike the standard OVDP, your penalty base does not include rental real estate. So for some people, this is a huge, huge win. And also, the streamline will, will cure all sorts of things besides missing FBAR. Like 3250, 3250A, 5471 for corporations, 8865 partnerships. Now, a little bit about the streamlined rules for those who are foreign. There's a test for residency, but if you do qualify, you go back three years and many returns, and now here's the greatest thing your penalty is 0% of the highest year in balance. So that's pretty nice if you happen to be living offshore, chore. Um, and it cures all sorts of things besides FBAR, like 3250, 3250A, 5471, 8865. And why would the IRS decide to penalize those who live offshore 0%, but those who live domestically 5%? Well, I think the assumption there is if you were living offshore as an expat, you had more of a reason to believe your foreign income was not taxable. I think that point is debatable, but that's the rules. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about the streamlined OVTP process. 
Okay, our first step when we do this is we want to we want to send in a standard OVDP preclearance, and I want to repeat that just to underline what we're saying. A standard OVDP preclearance. It is not a streamlined OVDP preclearance we send in. Now, why is this? Because there is no streamlined OVDP preclearance, and also. When we, when we submit that standard OVTP preclearance, we'll find out if, if our clients are under investigation. And in fact, it happened. We, we have happened twice so far. We submitted streamlined OVTPs only to get a call from a, uh, a U.S. attorney to say, oh, we started an investigation against your client. And so what happens there? Well, that gets to a point of negotiating. And we said, well, this person is actually not willful and they want to go through the program. And so we have been able, one of them so far, the other one we're still working on, one of them we have been able to get streamlined OVTP, even though a investigation commenced against us and the IRS attorney, the attorney for the Department of Justice just said, look, we can't get everybody. And if you're already thinking this person's streamlined, all right, that's good enough for us. We'll accept it. Um, and just because you're non-willful. So here's the thing to remember, right? Just because you are non-willful, just because you aren't guilty doesn't mean you won't be investigated or charged. That's the way it goes. So that's why we want to hand, send in our standard OVTP preclearance because if we just send in your submission first, well, there's a whole bunch of months that could go by before we get it in. And so that standard OVTP preclearance lets us know if you're clear to file. And there's really no other way. And the IRS might change that. I'm thinking they will, that they will have a, a, a standard, they will have a streamlined OVTP preclearance. And if so, we will be following that. Um, so again, we then we do your submission. We'll go into a little bit about what your submission is. There's a certification and amended returns. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's generally what it is. And you're missing all your mission information returns. Um, after we make your submission, we monitor their response and they may be coming back and asking us to substantiate some of the things we sent in. But what we're looking for, unlike the standard OVTP, what we're looking for is a letter from the IRS to say, we've made changes to your taxes. Compare this with the standard OVTP where you get a where you get a form or a letter 906. That letter 906 will be what the changes are. So you don't get that letter that you sign off on, but rather the IRS just sends you a, a notice saying we've made changes to your taxes. That means your streamline has been accepted and processed. Now, <clears throat> a big question we're always asked is what happens if I'm audited? Well, the answer is you're in no worse position, really, than if you went full OVDP and opted out. Um, and actually, you can kind of be in better position as long as you did not lie on that certification. So that certification must be written in a way that establishes your non-willfulness, but does not omit significant facts that don't tell the whole story. So it's critical that's done correctly. You don't want to lie on your certification because then if you do lie on your certification and you are audited, you know, they may look to elevate the severity of your case a little bit. So let's talk a little bit about willfulness because this is a linchpin of whether or not you can file streamlined OVTP. And one thing to realize is no one is perfect. Just because you're imperfect does not mean you are willful. No one is perfect on their tax return. I think you could look at anyone with a complicated foreign tax return. You could, you could find places where there's errors made. It's not that hard. There is really nothing as complicated in the world as preparing foreign tax returns. Because tax, tre tax treatments are subjected to so many different rules. And the IRS has a hard time keeping track of their own rules. And so just because you made a mistake does not mean you were willful. It's really something you need to discuss with an attorney. You know, we hear of a lot of people who came to us for a second or third opinion. They told us their facts and we said, you're non-willful. And they said, that's funny because this other attorney said, I was willful. I said, well, why'd they say that? Well, they said, well, I was educated. I said, okay, so you're educated. They're like, yeah, well, I was educated, so therefore I'm willful. But and I said, well, how are you educated? Well, I'm a highly educated doctor. <laughs> and I'm laughing, but, but you don't know anything special about taxes. No, I don't. So then why is your level of intelligence related to your willfulness? Just because you're highly intelligent, you can't be expected to know everything, right? So willfulness is not necessarily just because you're smart that doesn't mean you're willful. Now, for some people, um, there's cases where there is willfulness. 
and that things were done intentionally. We really can't lie for the for the for the reasons mentioned above on that certification. We can't lie. So what should you do if you don't qualify? Should you go underground? Should you roam the French catacombs? Well, no, you should probably come clean, and there might be a chance, uh, even if you're willful, to avoid the heavier penalties for those who, uh, under the, the IRS FAQ 7.2, the 50%, you could still opt out, and yeah, you might be assessed a non-willful penalty um, to lower it if you're not willing to pay that 50%. The IRS is assessing non-willful penalties pretty regularly in the uh, in the opt-outs, and those are the recent ones. Our older ones, we were getting, uh, the people who were originally coming clean, we were getting warning letters, and now we're starting to see those willful penalties. But those willful penalties pale into comparison to what the 27.5% penalty is, or the 50% penalty is. And so if you are willful, uh, I would not advise uh, going underground. I actually can't advise that. So I would just say you'd want to go, go into the standard OVDB and take a look at some of the ways to structure things so it would not be so horrible for you. So let's talk about who can file a streamline. Now we're going to assume non-willfulness because otherwise if we didn't, we wouldn't have this question right now. So individuals can file the streamline. Individuals with controlled foreign corporations, yes, you can. Uh, estates, uh, the administrator of the estate, yes, you can file uh, for someone who is deceased. Again, an FAQ 7.2, those 50% banks, uh, one of the recent ones being uh, Sovereign uh, in Panama, if you are on that list, you can file Streamline. Again, as long as you were non-willful. It's not to the bank what the banks were up to, but what you were up to. Now, something we heard in one of the original press releases the IRS had was they were going to start blacklisting some of those FAQ 7.2 banks. But we, they haven't. But I would say at some point they might start saying, okay, you've had enough time to come clean. If you are on this bank, we're figuring you don't want to comply, so you cannot get into the streamline. They'll still take you on the standard uh, with a 50% penalty. So who cannot file streamlined? Uh, a U.S. corporation cannot, and a U.S. trust cannot. Uh, that is a U.S. trust that has assets overseas. And the reasons why in this case is because if you're a U.S. corporation or a U.S. trust, the IRS is going to impute a higher level of knowledge that you set up this U.S. corporation, this U.S. trust, with perhaps the intent to evade taxes. Now that won't stop you. The U.S. corporation or trust can still opt out the standard OVDP for a lower penalty if appropriate. So now I'd like to talk about some geographic and some international trends that we've been seeing happening since this has been announced. You know, in Latin America, we go to Costa Rica. My friends in Costa Rica, we know that uh, holding companies are huge there. We actually have one client who has a holding corporation on a jet ski. And the reason why it's not for tax evasion purposes, but in Costa Rica and a lot of Latin American countries, everything is held in a holding corporation because U.S. expats are loose, looked at as juicy, juicy targets for litigation. So you always have everything inside corporation. Well, that means that an IRS form 5471 has to be completed if we are going to do the streamline. Now, com compare this with if you do the standard OVDP, you actually can disregard your entities. But in this case, you will have to do your form 5471s, and so that, that can get quite onerous to do. We have some law firms down in Costa Rica who help us uh, with our clients down there get their affairs together. In Panama, we happen to see a lot of trusts and inheritances and uh, they're the, people, the, the children who inherit the money had no idea what their parents were up to and there's really no way to determine what the state of affairs of the person who created the trust or the bank account did. We take a look at the person who inherited the money and what their willfulness was and that is a huge, huge determiner. Uh, what they actually were, not necessarily their parents, when you really can't ask them why they were doing something. You know, in expats down there, we know that they have an out-of-state, out-of-mind. It's really easy to go to a beach in Costa Rica and not think so much about Washington, D.C. So that's something that always happens, and it's not necessarily you didn't know, but maybe you just weren't thinking about it. And that's really something to think you to ask yourself when you're trying to determine your willfulness. Some people do go, I 
they will they have specifically told me I went to Costa Rica to avoid the IRS well they're you're not exactly going to be well you're not really going to be non willful compare that to someone who says you know I went to Costa Rica is having such a great time you know I forgot about it you know I, I guess I realize now that I should have um, that tends to be a little bit more non willful now some of the ge uh, geographic international trends that we see in Western Europe we see a lot of retirement funds and uh, trusts, foundations, and inheritance set up. And so that, you know, again, you may or may not be willful, uh, depending on uh, your knowledge of it. And if you inherited it, if the person who created it is no longer around, we really can't ask them what their intent was. Rather, we want to know what your intent was. Now, if the person only passed recently, if you understand the IRS, would have a, an ability to claw back an inheritance if that person also did not file a uh, streamlined disclosure. Um, so uh, for instance, if someone passed in uh, last year or two years ago, well, there's still that three years. So that estate, again, remember the estate can go through a streamline. So there would be this, the estate would want to go through it and then also the individual who inherited it uh, geographic trends, when we look to the United Kingdom, this is something that is really interesting, and I mean interesting in a horrible way, that life insurance, a lot of life insurance, a lot of foreign life insurance um, all across the globe is not considered life insurance for U.S. tax purposes. And the reason why is rather ugly. It's a protectionism by the domestic life insurance um, companies. And so it's treated as an investment. <clears throat> um, and then not only is it treated as an investment, when the proceeds are, are, are given, it's income. Um, now, some of it will be a recapture of premiums paid, so not the entire thing, not the entire amount will be taxable. But the IRS isn't done. At the same time, they'll say that this life insurance that isn't life insurance is subject to the excise tax on foreign life insurance. That is 1% of premiums paid, so rather obnoxious. The other... Uh, now, one thing to check is if your insurer is paying the premium for you, that one, I mean the, the excise tax for you, then they probably did go through the steps of getting their foreign life insurance uh, accepted by the IRS. It meets the definition. In the UK, uh, we see a lot of pensions. Uh, also in Austria, Germany, a lot of pensions. So for pensions, those actually might be blocked from income. Um, that if we would want to look at the treaty. And so you're, we're always looking at treaties to make sure that we have to report something. So as you can see, you know, when you're when you're preparing these returns, it's just not putting in numbers because what is the tax treatment of it? And it really depends. And just because something is called a life insurance, it doesn't mean the IRS really thinks of it as life insurance. In Australia, uh, we see a lot of life insurance issues coming up and superannuated funds. And in the Pacific Rim, we have a lot of active manufacturing corporations uh, that uh, U.S. expat may own with a few partners. Um, so we have some really complicated 5471 reporting to do. Uh, also, there are a lot of Social Security funds that aren't really Social Security. And this is something we notice in Singapore, that that is actually not exempt. And we have to get that cleaned up. Now, what should you do? Well, I'm going to tell you this right now. Not everybody in the world is going to get caught for their non-compliance. But if you do, it's devastating. The IRS will want to get a press release and sort of say the most awful things about you that you would probably disagree with and your family would pro probably disagree with. Uh, but it's really about getting that press release and ruling through fear and intimidation. Yay. And of course, everyone wants to know about FACA. Uh, FACA is a, supposed to be this awesome in, information sharing system that goes around and will make sure that the IRS knows about everything you're doing all around the world. And the IRS has been accepted by a whole host of countries. They've all accepted and agreed onto it. But, believe it or not, FACA isn't really up and running anywhere. Not even in Switzerland is it fully implemented. So... People are looking at this and say, okay, well, FACA may, might just die in the vine. There has been some, uh, the, the Republicans in Congress all were against FACA. And that there's supposed to be information sharing both ways. That not only is Switzerland supposed to share tax information with the U.S. for U.S. citizens, 
But the U.S. is supposed to go around. All these U.S. banks are supposed to investigate under the same criteria of saying, okay, who are our foreign bank account owners? None of the banks in the U.S. have started this. Are you kidding me? Have, I, have, I, have you heard of a bank in the U.S. starting to investigate, doing their due diligence to see what, what wires have been sent where? Is someone born in a foreign country? Are there any foreign addresses associated with this account? So FACA might not really end up being this whole, this, this, this great information that the IRS wants. I don't know if it really can be. I think it's something that is a little bit overly complicated and it's far too much for people to implement. Countries have tried to and they say to, but nobody's really able to. And so they keep postponing, you know, they keep postponing and postponing. So again, FACA might die on the vine. It just might. Uh, but my point is, I don't really care. FACA is just one tool that they have found. All the people that they have found so far have been outside FACA. There's already, there's already information sharing going on. And then there's also the, uh, one of the big things I've learned is from, from uh, one of my clients. Um, the real issue is that there's anti-money laundering laws. And that is huge. That's how they really find you. It's not FACA that's going to find you. It's going to be the anti-money money laundering. When you're, when you're pinged on that, that, and there, they're going to assume something criminal. And also recently, uh, there's John Doe summonses coming from uh, being issued to people who've had packages delivered from Sovereign Bank. Uh, just that Sovereign Bank that I mentioned that before in Panama. That is, the IRS goes to, let's just say FedEx, say, hey, FedEx, uh, we know that you, you, we have a pretty good idea that you've delivered packages from Sovereign in Panama. Can you give us the list of all the people you've delivered packages to in Panama, from Panama? And so FedEx has to respond to the summons and give the whole list of everybody who's received a the package. There's going to be law firms on there, you know. There's going to be CPAs on there, you know. So now the IRS, so there, there is your far bigger risk. So now the IRS is going to say, okay, here's the, here's the law firms and here's the CPAs. I think we should go see who's, I think we should go spend them a visit. So they're going to show up with another subpoena. And they're going to say, we want to see all the clients you have. And then there might be a claim of privilege. But then the grand jury will want to see it. The grand jury will take all the documents. And they're going to say, they're, hey, look, your attorney-client privilege doesn't apply if there's something that's involving a conspiracy, criminal conspiracy. So they could just blast right through that. And so now they're going to go to the CPAs and attorneys. I mean, you could go to the individuals, by the way. You could. But why do that? Because that's just going to give you one individual. But if you go to an attorney or a CPA who is helping people, well, now you get their entire client list. Now you really, really get a big bang for your buck. So that's how I see this more or less working. If you're using a professional who's helped you do something, well, you're not the only person they've helped. They've helped a lot more. And they also will go for people who've done the soft disclosures. If you've done a soft disclosure with the help of an attorney or CPA, well, they're not going to go to you directly. They're going to go to that CPA. Then they're going to get that CPA to turn against you or that, that attorney. You know, that CPA or attorney is going to do anything, going to say anything, maybe say things that aren't even true just to get their, just to save their hides. So that's something to think about how it really works. And so FACA, to me, it's not really the, the end all. It might not even be anything, but I still don't think that is that should um, give you much relief once you see how it actually works. You know, as I mentioned in the beginning, the, the IRS is investing a ton of money to training revenue agents to be familiar with offshore accounts. Right now, domestic audits are down, way down. A lot of the agents are working on these OVDPs, but at some point, we're going to sort of reach peak OVDP, and there'll be less and less people coming through. So what is the IRS going to do with all these revenue agents who are expertly trained with years of experience in these various foreign financial products that your average tax professional won't really understand? What do you think they're going to do? They're just going to send them, oh, okay, you guys finish that up. Why don't you go work on auditing construction workers? You think that's what's going to happen? No, the IRS is going to take its army of highly trained offshore auditors and it's going to set them loose. It's going to set them loose on all the people that they suspect. They have their key identifiers. I think it's something like 10,000 people they've identified that likely made a soft disclosure. They haven't even started getting to them. 
And the statute of limitations, they still have a lot of time, so I would imagine they're going to get to there. So that is really sort of my warning. This is a great time. I think 2015 is a great time to try to streamline if you can. Also, if you don't, uh, getting into standard would be a good idea. I think right now, if you're going to decide not to do it, not to comply, okay. You know, I'm not going to, again, I'm not going to try to scare everybody into this. I understand somebody doesn't want to do it. Just understand you're making your decision. Uh, that is what you're doing. You just can't postpone the decision and say, I'll think about it, I'll think about it, I'll think about it tomorrow. Well, you think about it long enough, somebody's going to make that decision for you. And that doesn't sound like a lot of fun. So for more information, check out our webinar on Standard Offshore Voluntary Disclosure Program. Also, I have a FBAR webinar, FBAR penalty webinar. I'll explain sort of how the FBAR came into being and how it's grossly misused. And you just go to irismedic.com. You'll find that information quite easily. If you would like an opinion about your offshore disclosure, or maybe a second opinion on what somebody else told you, you can email us, us at info at irsmedic.com. Give us a call at 888-477-4258. Please be advised, we are real people in a real office, and our office is open from 8.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and that would be negative 4, negative 5 GMT, uh, depending on daylight savings. This is Anthony Parent of Parent, Parent, and Win LLP, the IRS medic. And I thank you for listening.